Dear respected Thay, dear beloved community, today is the 10th of December, in the year 2020. We are in the still water hall of the Upper Hamlet. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about meditation. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> Who would have expected that? <laughs> mm. I, uh, I got a question from, from somebody. Asked me... Um, whether meditation can sometimes uh, be dangerous. So this is uh, someone who contacted me online, maybe he's been following some talks on YouTube, he's had some benefit from meditation, he shared that he's able to change uh, his way of reacting when he's angry, he's able to transform some of his suffering. And so he's experiencing the benefit of meditation. But he read uh, maybe, I don't know if it was a scientific paper or an article, um, but there, is, there have been some studies uh, reporting that sometimes meditation can lead to mental breakdown, to psychosis, to the eruption of trauma, um, to people feeling increased social anxiety or increased kind of um, obsessive uh, attention to bodily sensations, like overwhelming uh, insomnia, all kinds of things. So it's a little bit alarming. You read that and then you're like, oh, oh dear, <laughs> should I do this? Is this wise? Is this going to happen to me? So that's his question. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he recognized in the question, he said, I know this doesn't happen. I know this is in the minority of cases, it's rare. But the question is, how can I avoid this happening to me? Is there something I should be aware of um, to avoid this kind of risk? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, and it's actually one that I've been reflecting on for a while. I think it's natural that uh, as mindfulness has become a bit of a buzzword and we're kind of pasting, you know, mindful on everything, you know, to... Uh, um, sometimes we use... Is this still working? Yeah, sometimes we use mindfulness just to sell things. You know, um, sometimes, you know, we're kind of just jumping on the bandwagon, like mindfulness uh, seems to be a growth area, you know, so let's, uh, <laughs> let's cash in. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, there's this kind of mindfulness boom, maybe, there's a lot of awareness of it, there's a lot of people teaching some version of mindfulness or meditation. And, um, and so I think it's natural that there's also a little bit of a, a reaction. So there are some people saying, uh, let's be careful, hey, you know, mindfulness or meditation can also be dangerous. Um, And, uh, and those, those articles or those papers got, got a lot of uh, press. It's, it's, very, it's a good headline. It's like, the dark side of meditation. Did you know? Ah, shock, horror. Uh, it's, it's kind of easy. 
it's very easy to uh, to to um, to print that kind of thing. It's kind of juicy, you know. But I think we have to be very careful, very responsible in how we ask the question and um, how we kind of investigate. So when we ask the question, or when we say something like mindfulness can be dangerous or meditation can be dangerous, uh, we're already assuming that we know what it is, what mindfulness is, what meditation is. And we're kind of lumping together many, many, many different things. So I think the first question to ask is, if somebody has had a negative experience, what were they practicing? Because it's not enough just to say, well, they were practicing meditation, because there's so many different kinds of meditation. So what were they practicing? And were they practicing alone? Or were they practicing with a teacher? Or were they practicing with a community? Um, and I think some of the uh, criticism or the concern about the mindfulness movement is also legitimate. And it's important to, to kind of question and to, to kind of safeguard the experience of meditation and to maybe put some uh, health warnings, you know? So you have to read the fine print, you know? Be careful. Um, and then we have to ask, well, what do we expect from meditation? And why are we choosing to meditate? What's, the, uh, what's our intention? Because if we think that meditation or mindfulness is just a way to uh, experience some, something pleasant, um, <laughs> to relax a little bit, to de-stress, you know, light a candle, light a stick of incense. Ah, oh, so nice, meditation. Well, then we might be in for a surprise. So if we go into it with that expectation that mindfulness is only going to give rise to pleasant experiences, then, well, of course, it's <laughs> it might not work out like that. Um, and then we get disappointed or we feel like uh, we've been misled. Because that's also the responsibility of whoever is advertising mindfulness or selling an app or a retreat or, you know, a course or something. We have to be careful not to mislead. And uh, there's uh, criticism as well these days of uh, what they call mindfulness, which is the, there's a concern that, um, you know, maybe we're just, as a society, we are very stressed, we're very busy, uh, we're under a lot of pressure, and maybe some big corporations like to uh, make use of mindfulness to help people to normalize and to manage their stress so that they can continue and continue to uh, uh, be productive, make money, increase the, the, the bottom line, uh, increase the, the share value, increase your creativity, innovation. It's great if you can just uh, get all your employees to do a little bit of mindfulness and then they stop complaining about being stressed and they continue to work just as much as they did before, well, surely that's great. And then there's a little bit of concern, I think, from people in the mindfulness meditation community, like, is that, is that good? Should we be doing that? Should we be contributing to maintaining the status quo or allowing people to manage their stress and their ill-being so that they can continue? It's an important question. Um,
because we can, uh, and the, yeah, there's also the question of, is it okay to have mindfulness in the army? You know, we have snipers who are trained now with mindfulness so that they can uh, calm their emotions and uh, shoot more accurately. Is that a good use of mindfulness? So what is the, um, what is the intent and what is the expectation? And I think we all need to ask ourselves, like, what, do, what am I doing this for? Why do I choose to uh, sit down on a cushion and follow my breathing, relax my body, get in touch with my feelings? What do I expect or what do I hope for? And um, I, I don't want to presume to give any definitive answer because for me all of this is an open reflection. It's a kind of something that I want to continually reflect on for myself. I don't feel... Um, I don't think it's a question that we should just close with, with an answer and say, right, that's it. We have to keep it open. So I know for myself, uh, I meditate, I practice mindfulness, because I have the feeling and the experience that it allows me to to have an encounter with reality. And that isn't always going to be pleasant. So if I think that it is, then I might get a little disappointed. And um, an encounter with reality means also an encounter with my suffering. And it's also an encounter with the suffering of our society, of the planet. So if we expect only pleasant feelings, we're in for a shock. And that shock might be too much. It might lead us to feel uh, very unstable. And if we're alone in that moment, it can be very hard and it can feel extremely overwhelming. And I believe that that's one of the reasons, at least, that we in Plum Village always try to emphasize the importance of practicing as a community together. So that when that encounter with reality happens, maybe when some suffering is touched and it starts to come up, and maybe we are overwhelmed, we're not alone. We have good spiritual friends. We have people around us who can help. And we take turns to suffer. And maybe one day, I'm overwhelmed. And I need you to be there, to help me. To help me to hold it, because it's too much for me. And it's so wonderful to have a community to help in those moments so we don't have to go through that moment alone. And then maybe another day is your turn. 
and you have to face something, something painful, something hard. But then maybe I can be there for you. And we can uh, be there for each other in those moments. So, still trying to answer this question of like, what are the dangers? One, maybe uh, if possible, find a community. Find spiritual friends, find people to accompany you on the path. Because I don't want to... Uh, I think it would be very irresponsible to give people the idea that meditation is only going to give rise to positive experiences and pleasant sensations. That's, that's crazy. And it's not even what we want. Because that would be to, uh, to avoid the truth. And at least for me, I want to meditate in order to come closer in touch with the truth. And I know that the truth is it's difficult. The, the, the suffering is immense. I sometimes feel like um, we can get uh, we get sold meditation as a, a kind of panic room. You know, uh, you can have a, maybe very wealthy people, they have a, a panic room in their house, somewhere they can retreat to, with like a bunker, and close the door, and you have food, and things to drink, and you know, you're completely safe, and nobody can get to you. And maybe there's, there are um, kinds of meditation that we can get into. We can train ourselves to have a kind of bliss experience, a very strong concentration, very positive, very pleasant experience. Um, and we get used to having that kind of place to retreat to. And... Uh, it, it becomes like our, you know, our little bunker inside. But I, I think at least in in our tradition in Pampadij, this is not uh, this is not the kind of meditation that we that we teach or that we want to develop. But it's sometimes confusing because in our tradition we also speak of uh, coming back to the island within. Right? Or coming back to ourself. Or um, taking refuge in ourself. Now I'm really curious to know what, what people actually think that is? Or what, what do we do when we say we come back to the island within? What does that actually mean? So this is uh, an expression which is based on one of the final, one of the last teachings that the Buddha gave during his lifetime. They come back to the island within, take refuge in the island within. Now what did he mean? So I don't think that he meant build a panic room and cut yourself off from the world and shut the door, everything's going to be okay. I don't think that's what he had in mind. It doesn't mean ignore the suffering. It doesn't mean ignore the world. It doesn't mean ignore the people around you at least as I understand it. So, 
you don't have to take my word for it. Okay, this is just uh, for me. It's an exploration, and I hope maybe just to stimulate an exploration in each of us, so we can each make our own discovery of what that island within might be. We have to ask ourselves: Do I know how to take refuge in the island within? Does it work? Does it work only when the sun's shining and I feel good and I'm relaxed and I don't have any stress, I don't have any projects, everything's fine? But does it also work when I'm overwhelmed? when I'm stressed, when there's somebody in front of me who's expressing suffering or who's making me upset? Does it work when I'm overwhelmed by the feeling of dread or despair about climate catastrophe? Does it still work? Because if it doesn't, then maybe that's not it yet. Maybe that's not really the island within. So we have to keep uh, exploring, keep searching to find what is it really. Brother Famhan would like to invite the bell. Somebody else asked me a question. Um, I think it came uh, through the app. We have a Plum Village app, for those of you who don't know. Uh, this is also related to the first question. Some of the criticism uh, that comes about the mindfulness community is it's, people are saying it's irresponsible <coughs> to leave people without guidance. So I was saying at first, like, we need a community, maybe we need a guide, a teacher, or at least a friend. And so some of the criticism is, well, if you just say to people, practice with an app, maybe that's not responsible, because they are then, to some extent, alone. Or maybe we give the impression that you can just practice with the app and that's enough and you'll be fine. And then maybe people get in trouble may have a bad experience and get overwhelmed. So, uh, <clears throat> but we do have an app. Uh, is it irresponsible? I don't know. I think we can have an app and uh, also make it clear that <clears throat> we really encourage everyone to find a Sangha. A Sangha is a, just a community of practice. To find a Sangha, find your friends, find friends on the path, practice together. Maybe together you can listen to a guided meditation from the app. But so this question came because we have one of these, one of the guided meditations on the app is about um, embracing feelings, mindfulness of feelings. 
And this is a guided meditation we do a lot in Plum Village, and one of them is breathing in. I feel alive. Breathing out, I feel joy to be alive. Feeling alive, feeling joy. Sounds good, right? It'd be nice to feel joy. But this question came, uh, I've been using this app, I tried this guided meditation, <clears throat> but when you say, uh, I feel joy, I don't feel any joy. All I feel is sadness. I feel despair. I feel fear. I feel pain. I don't feel any joy. Good question. What do I do? How do I practice? <clears throat> there was also a, a comment on our YouTube channel. The other day we had a panel and um, somebody commented, uh, forgive me if I don't get the phrasing exactly right, as I'm paraphrasing roughly, but it was along the lines of, uh, you talk about understanding um, the suffering of what it's like to be in the lockdown and with the pandemic and so on, but, but you're all in Plum Village. You're all in a bubble. Uh, you, 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 you can still live together. You have your special quarantine bubble. So there's no way you can understand what we're going through. Don't say you can understand, because you can't. Another question is, uh, what right do we as monastics have to say <clears throat> or to recommend meditation for people uh, who live high stress, busy lives? You know, how can, how can we sit here and say, oh, you know, do some meditation, it'll help you to, uh, to be more relaxed? to have less stress. How can we say that when, uh, you know, when we live in a monastery and we don't have any stress, we don't have any, anything to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I've, I've, this is something I've heard from people. So it's all very well you talk about relaxation and meditation, but, but your experience of life has nothing to do with our experience of life. So how can you talk about, you know, how can you uh, offer us uh, effective practice when you don't know what we're dealing with? Well, are you sure? <laughs> I don't say uh, that we do know. I can't be sure of that myself. That would be uh, also irresponsible to claim that we do know. But maybe I can offer as a suggestion uh, not to assume that we don't know. Uh, it's more interesting <laughs> to rest in uncertainty.
So I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, So the other day, um, when I woke up in the morning, I felt completely, utterly overwhelmed. I mean, practically panicking. Uh, my mind was racing. I was... Um, in the midst of trying to coordinate uh, a recording session, quite a complicated recording session, uh, to offer a recording of a new song to be sent out with a newsletter which had a deadline. Um, and I had made it much more complicated than it needed to be because that's just what I do. <laughs> And, um, and even as I was planning that day, the recording session, how we were going to do it, I could already hear in my mind, I could still hear the music, and I was already writing like, new parts to layer onto the music that was already complicated. And I thought, maybe we can add strings, and then we can invite our friends from around the world to record, and they can send in videos and recordings, and we can put it all together, and it would be amazing. But this was causing some stress. <laughs> and that's not the only thing I had to do that day. Uh, I had, I think, three different meetings. One for uh, fundraising, one for construction, uh, and something else. Um, something with the brothers. And, uh, and I was thinking, and in a few days I have to give a Dharma talk. That's this one. And the deadline is like the day before the Dharma talk for the, for the newsletter. And I have on the day before the Dharma talk, I also have three meetings. And uh, that morning I also had to uh, listen to, um, well, I, I had arranged to uh, have a conversation with, with somebody who was um, experiencing a lot of distress. Um, not somebody here, uh, so I was going to have a Zoom call with them. So that was also just like, okay, in a few minutes I have to be present for that. And, and, and there was a whole laundry list of things I had to take care of, things I had to do, people I had to meet. Um, and, and I was exhausted and I hadn't had enough sleep and I was a little bit uh, sick, I had an infection. Um, and uh, and I felt, yeah, totally, totally overwhelmed. But I have a practice. And I have confidence in the practice. So I know that in that situation, there is something that I can do. And I have uh, faith based on experience that it works. So, I recognize very quickly that like, this is the moment when I really need to apply the practice. I cannot solve this situation at the level of my conscious mind. I know that. The conscious mind really believes that it can. It believes that if I make a good plan, if I make a good to-do list, I can figure out my priorities, I can get it all sorted out, I can you know, like prepare myself, I can figure out exactly what I need to do. The conscious mind really believes that that's the way to solve the problem. But I don't. I don't have faith in that because I also have experience that that doesn't work. But when I approach the problem like that, my mind just spins out even more. 
and I get kind of stressed and I get a little bit irritated and I, I maybe am more irritable with the people around me. Um, I, I don't trust that way anymore. I have another way. So what I have faith in is that if I can quiet my mind, the, the constant chattering of my mind, then I have the experience that when I'm able to do that, when I'm able to completely still my mind, I can get in touch at a deeper level with what is really going on. Because I know also that the suffering, I, the suffering I'm experiencing in that moment may not only be to do with having lots of things to do. Because I know that this, this reaction of feeling overwhelmed, of feeling panic, is, uh, is kind of like a, it's a pattern that I've recognized in my life that comes up to some extent independent of the situation and the, and the immediate proximate causes. So I know that this suffering is being triggered by these causes, but it's not only to do with what's immediately happening in my life. So even figuring out what to do now with all of these problems doesn't address the underlying suffering which is a pattern which is in my body and in my emotions and in my mind. And I, and I know it because I've seen the same reaction to different situations, right? So if the situation is different but the reaction is the same, then that means that that reaction is to some extent coming from somewhere else. And I know that if I can still my mind, then I can get in touch more deeply with what is really going on which is also to some extent a mystery. Right? I don't really know necessarily, but I, I know that there's some kind of, there's something in my whole being which is being jangled, you know, which is reacting. And I know that I can take care of it. I have the confidence that I know how to embrace it. I know how to calm it. I know how to soothe it, and I know that when I'm able to do that, then what arises is peace and joy, clarity, and even sometimes, with a bit of luck, insight and freedom. And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to do all the things I have to do. It means that I can do all of those things from a place of freedom. And I've had the experience in the past that when I'm able to do that and calm myself down, still my mind, then actually all of the things I have to do become easy. But I know that the problem is not really the problem. What well, The problem is my reaction to the problem. So if I can take care of my reaction, usually uh, life is actually quite manageable. So, what do I actually do? Um, for me, I always start with a body scan. I know there's tension in my body. I can see people doing this now. <laughs> yes, yes, we have bodies there may be some tension. So, I propose that we actually do this now. It's more interesting if we make it uh, practical, okay? So I know I have a body, but my mind is racing. So if I try immediately to do a body scan, a body scan might, like a full in-depth body scan, might take 15 minutes or half an hour or 45 minutes. But I know that if I try to do that, I will fail because my mind is too busy, it's dispersed. So the first thing is to recognize the state of dispersion and be honest. Like, I've been meditating for years. I, I might prefer 
to deny the reality. Say, but I'm a meditator, I can't possibly be dispersed. Surely. Well, first thing, I have to be honest. I'm a mess. My mind is all over the place. So then I have to find the medicine which corresponds to the situation. So I know in this state of dispersion my capacity to concentrate is very limited. So I have to... Is it falling off? <laughs> Tech support. This is also a moment of taking refuge in Sangha. Thank you. Okay, so my mind's racing, I'm all over the place, I can't concentrate. But maybe I can do a 10 second body scan. I think I can do that. So I have to choose something which I know that I can. Uh, accomplish. Right, so I measure the state of dispersion quite high, so choose something really easy to do. Because I know that in order to continue, I need to some extent to have the experience of success. Like if I try something too hard, if I say, okay, I have to still my mind and I have to concentrate and I have to stop thinking and do a body scan and it's going to take half an hour and I have to scan my whole body, I'm going to fail. And then what I do is I practice failing. And I give up after a while because, well, failure is no fun. So I have to do something that I know I can accomplish and get the experience of success. So I give myself very, something very easy to do, something I know I can succeed at. That maybe I don't know, but at least I have a good chance. So it goes something like this. Very, very rough. It's like, ah, I have a face. Yes, I have a face. Hmm. I have hands. Yeah, hands. Arms. Mm -hmm. Shoulders. Yeah. Chest. Yeah. Yeah. Stomach. Mm -hmm. Pelvis. Yeah. Legs. Feet. Genitals. Oh, did it. <laughs> and I didn't lose my concentration. I didn't get thrown off. I succeeded. So now I can do it again. And this time I go a little bit more slowly because now I've already changed a little bit the state of my mind. Still pretty dispersed, but maybe slightly less than before. So now I can do maybe a 30 second body scan. <sighs> yeah, this is my mouth. Mm -hmm. This is my nose. <sighs> These are my eyes. Oh, a bit tense. Mm, a bit tired. Mm -hmm. oh. These are my hands, thumbs, fingers. <sighs> okay. These are my arms. Feel the weight of my arms. Mm. Right arm, left arm. Okay. These are my shoulders. Oh, I feel the breath coming into my chest. I feel my belly moving with the breath. I feel my pelvis. I feel my thighs, my calves, my shins, my ankles, feet, toes, soles of the feet, the genitals the digestive tract, from the intestines all the way up through the stomach, the esophagus, the throat, to the tongue, and I'm back. I did it. Again, I didn't lose my concentration. Ah, now I'm starting to settle a little bit. 
My mind's actually starting to get interested in the process. It's starting to calm down. Maybe I didn't succeed, if I'm fully honest, I didn't succeed the first time. I had to have a little bit of determination. I still got dispersed with my worries and my distractions and projects. I was like, no, I know I can do this. Come back. I know I can do a 30-second body scan. I say 30 seconds, it's not just, you know, a little bit longer than the first one. So I wait until I can succeed. I can do it. And then I do it again. And now I take a little more time. I think just pinch it, right? So now I can feel my tongue. Maybe I'm aware of my uh, the palate of my mouth, the teeth. Maybe I notice there's some tension in my jaw, around my mouth, and I just leave it there. I don't even try to relax. I just allow whatever sensation is there to be there. And that's already, a, it's a little uncomfortable actually, just to allow, to notice, ooh, I'm holding some tension. But I try to say to myself, Wow, I guess there's a need. There's something in me that needs to hold this tension. This is the way I hold my face, habitually. Maybe I can recognize in that pattern of holding, I feel an echo of my grandmother. Oh, wow. This is my grandmother's attitude to life, a little bit pinched, a little bit negative. Like the attitude is something like, nah. <laughs> no, it's not good. I don't care what you say. No, life will not be kind. Life will be hard. I've suffered. You tell me it's good, it's not. Nope. And I'm just noticing, oh, wow, okay, yeah. I'm, I have that, to some extent, a trace of that attitude. I hold it in my face. Okay, maybe there's a need. There's some kind of need that's being met. You know what, I'm just gonna hold this like this. So I just give permission. I allow myself to hold that like that. And then I can start to feel, oh, wow, what is this need to hold my face like that? And maybe I, it's not just physical tension now, but I feel the aura of a kind of, of an emotional attitude to, to life. I'm getting in touch with my suffering. It may not be pleasant. I may not like what I find. But it's okay. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of my suffering because I have the experience that when I am more authentically, more honestly in touch with my suffering, what arises 
is compassion. Immediate, a flood of compassion. It's a natural response. So I just allow the sensations to be there, whatever they are. Oh. I notice the sensations around my eyes. What is the strain I, and the intensity I hold in my forehead and in my eyes? A kind of intensity of thinking or focusing or intent or volition or something. Just, but it's the feeling, it's not the words. I'm just putting words on it, but I'm trying to feel like, wow, this is the tension I hold in my eyes. Okay, let it be there. My right eye feels like this. This is the feeling of my right eye. My left eye feels like this, different. This is the feeling of my left eye. It's different. And this is the feeling of my two eyes together. Not necessarily symmetrical, a kind of weird feeling. A little bit different on one side and the other side. I try not to paint over the actual sensation with what my expectation of the sensation should is. I have an expectation that maybe my face should feel symmetrical. But that might not be what the reality is. So I have to allow the reality to manifest. And then I can feel my two hands. Maybe I notice that there's some holding, kind of, maybe a hand is slightly clenched. And I don't release it, I just let it be there like that. And notice, wow, okay, there's something in this pattern of holding that I need that it's, it's meeting some kind of need. Okay, let it, let it be there. Let me g encounter what is it behind that. Mm. Let me feel the weight of the whole of my right arm, how it connects to the shoulder and through the shoulder to the spine, the neck, how it hangs from the scapula. Oh the weight and the shape of my right arm, my left arm, left hand. It's different. Maybe one shoulder might feel totally different from the other one. What is the actual sensation present? Not what I expect, not what I'd like my shoulder to feel like, but what it actually feels like right now including if there's some discomfort. Allowing it to be exactly as it is. And then feeling my two arms together. I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes it feels like one shoulder is, is like up here and the other one is down there. It's really weird. And the internal sensation is not what we expect, necessarily. But maybe a tiny difference in reality, in my internal sensation, it feels huge. It feels like I'm a monster, asymmetrical, weird. But I'm getting in touch with the
is a very interesting guided meditation. Guided meditation with uh, tech support intermission every so often. So it's interesting to discover what is the actual sensation present. Not what my prediction of the sensation is. We talk a lot about coming back to the body, coming back to the sensations in the body. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why is that so important in our practice? This is a little interlude. I'll come back to the body scan. But it's important to understand, like, why do we do this? What's the point? For me, this is, like, this is the, uh, uh, the core of my meditation practice. I've been doing this for years and years and years, and I, I'm still doing it. Some people ask me, like, uh, okay, I, I get it, yeah, body scan, okay, following the breath, fine. But what about, like, deep meditation? What do you do next? How do you go deeper? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I know this goes pretty deep for me. I'm still doing it, not, not bored yet. And if it's boring, or if you don't find that it takes you into concentration, then maybe you haven't really done it yet. Possibly. So what's happening when we say that we come back to our body? Are we really coming back to our body? How can we know? How can we be sure? The brain is very complex, and its relationship with the body is very complex. Within the brain, we have many different mental maps, representations of the body. We also have stories, we have ideas, we have uh, maybe also self-hatred, maybe we have self-loathing in relation to our body, maybe we've experienced abuse, maybe we've experienced trauma. All of these things can be in our body. Maybe we've been educated in a way that cuts us off from our body. Maybe we're completely alienated from the sensations in our body. I know for myself, the way I was educated, nobody ever taught me to pay attention to the sensations in my body. That, wasn't ne that was never discussed. Everything was about develop your mental uh, capacity, your ability to solve difficult problems in mathematics or something else. Everything was about that. Nobody taught me how to pay attention to the sensations or take care of them or pay attention to my feelings and take care of my feelings. So it may be something very new and we may be very alienated. So it may take time and we have to be very patient and we have to know a little bit about how, how it works, what the architecture is. Um, what we know from modern neuroscience is that mostly uh, our experience is a kind of prediction. So I say we know. Well, we don't really know. It's a theory. It's a current theory, which is, happens to be in vogue. It's very popular and it's getting a lot of traction. It may or may not be completely right. Um, and there's many versions of the same theory. It's called the predictive coding model of uh, consciousness. 
So it goes something like this, that there's, there's two main types of process happening in our awareness. One which is top-down, that means from the cognitive level, predicting down what is the sensation that is going to be arriving. Can I predict what the next sensation is going to be? That's a top-down process. And the other one is a bottom-up process, which is from our senses, from our touch, smell, taste, uh, hearing, and sight. Masses of uh, sensory stimuli coming in, arriving in our nervous system. Enormous flood of information coming in in every moment. And this comes into our nervous system, into our brain, and somehow tries to filter up into our awareness. But we know right now, sitting here, that mostly we're ignoring almost all of those sensations. That what we're actually aware of in our conscious mind is a tiny fraction of what's actually happening in this present moment. And we may believe that what we are aware of now, what we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, is what is actually there, is what is actually happening. We may believe that what we're experiencing corresponds to the reality, sort of fairly normal thing to believe. It may or may not be true. Uh, it turns out that because this flood of bottom-up information is so overwhelming, the brain, in an effort to conserve energy, uh, this is the theory, and I don't say this is completely accurate, but the current theory is that it says, well, instead of uh, constantly paying attention to all of this information, what if I just predict what it's going to be and then check if there's an error in the prediction? So if I can predict what's going to happen in the next moment, then I don't need to actually feel it directly. I can just say, yeah, I know, I know, got that, yep, got it, I know what's happening, fine. Yeah, it's all good. Prediction correct, confirmed, 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 still working, yeah, everything's fine. And only when something differs from my prediction does it need to filter up into my conscious awareness and then I update. And this happens, there are many chains of prediction and, and filtering up, um, all inter interlocking. So there's feedback and feed forward, it's a very complex process. But the main thing for us to be aware of as meditators is that this prediction process is happening and, um, or may be happening, okay? We don't want to assume too much, but we can play with it. We can see, does this correspond to our ex experience? And one practical demonstration would be to say that you know exactly what the next word is going to be that's going to come out of my Right. You didn't need to hear it. But your brain already knew what it was. So if I, even if I had said it, what you would have experienced may not have been the actual sound of me saying it, but your experience is actually just the prediction. Because you don't need to hear it. You already know what it is. You know what it's going to sound like. You know when it's going to happen. You just predict it. So you don't need to let that information actually come all the way to consciousness because you already know. So basically the top-down process, the prediction process, is canceling out most of the bottom-up information. It's just saying, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Don't need to know, I'm good, it's all fine. So take, for example, the sensation of sitting. Until I said that, I'm pretty sure you were completely unaware of it. The sensation of your butt on the chair or the cushion. There's no need for you to be aware of it because you know you can, your brain can automatically predict it feels like this now, so the next moment, high probability is going to feel exactly the same or roughly, right? 
It's a pretty good guess. Nothing, I mean, what's going to happen? You know, it's not suddenly going to feel totally different. This is a fairly good prediction. So your brain just says, yeah, I know what sitting on a cushion feels like. Done that before lots of times. So I predict it away. I don't let the information come up because I don't need to. Same with the breath. Maybe some of you were already paying attention to your breath before I said that. But unless you deliberately pay attention to it, there's this incredibly complex orchestrated motion happening all the time in your body that you're completely unaware of. So it's happening, but you're not aware of it because you can predict it, you don't need to pay attention to it. Unless something unexpected happens, you get surprised or you know you have a strong reaction to something, suddenly your heart starts pounding Suddenly you start hyperventilating. Oh, now I'm aware of my breath because it's different from what I expected. Or the heartbeat. You have this giant muscle in your chest. It's pounding away all the time. You can't feel it, mostly. It's not that the sensations are not there. They are. But it's just we're able to accurately predict what the next heartbeat will feel like so we don't allow that information to filter up. So why, as meditators, do we go on and on about paying attention to the sensations in the body? What's the point? This is a real question. I really ask myself this all the time. Especially because we're supposed to teach it, right? We're supposed to share it with people. Yeah, going back to our body, mindfulness of the body, where the body. Yeah. But we should know why. What's the point? So I, my current hypothesis is that, um, and this is not just mine, I mean, it's sh shared with quite a few people who are kind of thinking about this. Um, is that we, we want to be in touch with reality. Right? We want to find out what's really going on. We have the kind of intuition that maybe we're not really in touch with what's going on. Maybe we're kind of fooling ourselves quite a lot. Maybe we're living all kinds of partial truths. Maybe we're living in a world of stories that we have about ourselves. If somebody asks you what is your, you know, to tell your story, you say, well, I was born here and I grew up there. I went to school there, and I studied this, and I went to university, and I got a job. It's a nice story, but is it, is it the truth? Is it the whole truth of what we are? And the story goes on. It's like, and I want to do this, and I want to go there, and I want to find my true love, and I want to have a family, or I want, and it's not nothing wrong, you know, it's all good. But to some extent, it's, it's a narrative that may be limited in its applicability to reality. Because that narrative, for example, depends on the existence of somebody, a separate self. And that's just a kind of convenient fiction. And we know as soon as we start to look, what we discover is this complex web of interconnections with everything that is, with the air that surrounds us, with the food that we eat, with our ancestors, with our friends, with our loved ones, with the world, with the stars. With the so that whole, like, I went to school, and I'm going here, and I'm doing this, it's like, hmm, only partly right. Because it ignores all of that interconnected stuff, right? But we live in this world of narrative, and we have a name and an identity card and intentions and desires and preferences and political views and affiliations and all kinds of things and skills and attributes and you know, people we like, people we don't like. 
But we should be very careful with all of that stuff. And I think as meditators, we have a kind of intuition that there's more going on than just these stories. Those stories might be also these terrible things happened to me as a child and I'm a victim and oh, woe is me and life is so hard and you know, life is difficult and unfair and uh -huh. I'm not, I don't say that, you know, I don't want to sound like uh, not compassionate but I'm just I think as meditators we may have the intuition that the path to freedom doesn't lie in uh, it doesn't is not at that level of these narratives there's another way so uh when we're able to get in touch directly with the sensations in our body, to some extent what happens is that we override this mechanism of predicting and um, cancelling out the actual sensation. Okay? So the, the, there's actual, uh, I mean it's actually at the level of the neurons what's happening is that the upward flow of information from the senses is being inhibited by the prediction. But if we choose to deliberately pay attention to the present moment sensations that in a sense we don't need to pay attention to, right? the sensation of contact with the ground, in our legs, in our buttocks, with our back on the chair, if we're sitting on the chair, the sensation of the air on our skin, there's no need to pay attention to any of those things. But if we choose to do so deliberately, we're kind of counteracting the prediction process. And maybe what we allow it to do is to become quiet and to stop. And maybe there's a chance then to get in touch with reality directly. And maybe what we discover is not what we expected. So there I am, I'm still lying on my bed. I'm still a little bit overwhelmed. My thoughts are still to some extent racing, but by now I'm in my third or fourth body scan, starting to settle down. And I'm determined because I have the experience that this works, that I can quiet my mind. So even when my mind spins off, I bring it back. Gently, but with some degree of firmness and resolve because I know that it works and I know it takes a little bit of determination. So I come back and I'm paying attention now very in a very kind of fine way to the actual sensations, aware that if I'm not careful, I may just be predicting what those sensations are going to be like and then I'm not really in touch. So I'm kind of aware of the risk. You know, before I was saying, like, maybe my shoulders don't feel symmetrical? Oh, it's interesting, because if I'm not careful, and I just do a body scan, uh, I'm aware of my two arms, my shoulders, I might actually only be in touch with the expectation of the sensation and not the actual sensation. So this is why I also said before, are you sure that you've really done this? 
that you're really in touch with your sensations. And I ask that myself all the time. We need to keep asking that, keep the question mark alive. Because the energy of the habit of prediction is, is millions of years old. It's, it's part of our biology. So of course, it's gonna kick back in at any moment. So we have to keep checking, like am I really in touch with what is actually happening right now in the present moment? And so I have lots of ways, and I think each of us need to develop lots of ways to keep checking in. So one thing I use is this question of symmetry, I, so I check. So I know that maybe my mental image of my body is that it's roughly symmetrical, but that the reality is that it's not. So if I sort of think that the sensations are, se are symmetrical, then probably I'm tricking myself. I'm just in touch with the representation, not the actual sensation. So I check the right side of my pelvis, my leg feels like this. And I really try to check, I, I don't expect it to feel any particular way. Uh, this is what it actually feels like. And I might also ask myself, what is the uh, pattern of holding in my right hip? Because for sure, it's not completely relaxed. There's some, something slightly being held. So I allow for that possibility as well. I say, oh, okay, what is the pattern of holding currently there in my right hip? And I don't try to change it. Just become aware of it. Become aware of the weight of my right leg. How it connects up into the abdomen, the spine. Then I move to the left, I'm like, okay, what is the pattern here? And it's not really like, if, if, it's, if I'm too much thinking of a mental image of my leg, because I have a, an, an image, a, re a representation in my mind of how my leg actually, sort of how I think it should be or how I think it looks, how I think it is anatomically, but I try not to do that, I try to say like, no, what does it actually feel like right now? And that might include to some extent an emotional component. How does it actually feel? And kind of like an energetic com component as well. How does it actually feel right now to be a left leg here? Hmm. Left leg. Hmm. Kind of feels like this. And how does it feel to have to be two legs? Not necessarily symmetrical. Oh, interesting. Really not the same at all. Like maybe there's a little more weight on one side than on the other. Maybe it feels like one thigh is slightly rotated. Maybe it feels like one side of the pelvis is higher than the other. Whatever it is, just try to allow it to be there, allow myself to discover it. And I have to allow for the possibility as well that there's something unexpected, that there's an emotional aura in the pattern of holding. There might be a lot of suffering. There might be a lot of pain, a lot of emotional trauma stored up, waiting for me to have the time, the patience, the gentleness, the mm, confidence, the non-fear to embrace it, to recognize it, to accept it. Just patiently waiting there. And if, that, if some of those sensations are strong, the reaction might be, nope, nope, I don't want any of that. No, thank you. This stuff, this meditation stuff is not for me, it's not good. Unpleasant sensations, alert. 
that's not what it said on the tin. They told me it would feel good, that I would be relaxed, that everything would be nice, that I'd become more effective in my job. They didn't tell me I would get in touch with existential dread, self-loathing, panic, fear, pain, sorrow, despair. No, 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 no. I didn't want any of that. That's not what I signed up for. No, thank you. I want something else. What else is on the menu? Can I have a smoothie? I don't like this stuff. I'm going to tell all my friends meditation is bad. It doesn't work. It gives rise to very unpleasant feelings. But no, the point is, if those feelings arise, it's good. It's good. Because our aspiration, our intuition is that we want to be in touch with reality. We want to find out what's really going on and we know that what's going on is complicated. It's a mixture. Of course there's wonder, of course there's joy, of course there's life and the celebration of the beauty of life that we can discover in every moment. But there's also profound suffering. But it's not a bad thing to be in touch with that, it's good. We have to be courageous. We have to find within us the courage and the non-fear to go into that suffering. Of course, we also have to know our limit. And there may be times that it is too much and we need help. Maybe we need the help of a trusted friend, someone we can confide in, someone who can say, wow, in meditation something came up and it was like, oh God, and I felt this feeling in my throat and, ah, and I don't know what it is. And, ah. and we need to be able to share that with somebody because that's a lot. That's a lot to hold on your own. So please, if you're on your own using an app, Great, but I, I, I wish, I pray that you can find a friend, find a community of practice, find people you trust who can hold this experience with you. Because we each have our moments in, you know, in the valley of uh, the shadow of death. You know? We go through the the uh, the cloud of unknowing, you know, we go through the dark night of the soul. It's like there's moments when it is tough. You're alone and you're in the desert and you don't know what's going on and the sensations are overwhelming and it's not what you thought. But it is what we want. At least for me, I want to be in touch with reality. I know that I want to help. I want to find out what's really going on and find an appropriate response. And that means what's going on in me and around me. That means I want to be in touch with the suffering which is in me, which is the suffering which is transmitted to me by my ancestors, by my society, I want to find out. I want to have the chance to encounter it honestly, without fear. And I know that it's not going to be easy. I don't expect it to be easy. I don't expect it to always be pleasant. But I know that when I do have that authentic encounter, what happens is this wave of compassion comes up. Or maybe sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, okay, if I'm really honest. Maybe sometimes I also feel overwhelmed and like, whoa, no, it's too much. I just want to read a book. I want to go and talk to someone. 
I want to run away. I can't handle it. It's too much. Yeah, sometimes. But not as much as before. And if I want to get in touch with the suffering in myself, I also know that because I'm an, I'm an indivisible part of the whole, I'm interconnected with everything that is, I know that if I get in touch with myself, I'm also going to get in touch with the world. There's no escape. There's no panic room. I can't close the door. It's not just because I live in a monastery that I'm not aware of what's happening in the world. I'm part of the world. There's no force field, you know, that protects us here. All of us have families. All of us have friends, people, uh, you know, we know people who have died, who are in hospital right now, who are sick, who are dying. All of us. And even beyond you know, our, our personal direct connections with people. It's just the fact of our interbeing is that what we're experiencing right now in our body already contains, already is the whole cosmos. So if I feel some sorrow, if I feel some despair, if I feel some dread, is it really my Is it really mine? Or is it also the world's pain? The world is not something outside of us. It is us. The environment is not something out there. So whatever we feel, it's only partly ours. It's partly individual, partly collective. And the more honestly we can encounter that, the more honestly we are meeting the actual situation of suffering now in the world. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to watch the news. It's already here. It's happening in every cell of our body. And yeah, sometimes it's hard. But the wonderful thing is that when we can fearlessly allow ourselves to be in touch, there is this natural response of a deep desire to hold, to embrace, to soothe, But we may need to uh, work a little to discover that, to find the root to the arising of compassion. We offer a compassion chant, often at the beginning of our retreats, the Namavalokiteshvara chant. And the number of times I sat in the uh, introduction to that chant that our teacher Tai would give, and he gave us this formula you know, it's like, how do we get in touch with compassion? We can't just say, okay, I'm going to feel very compassionate suddenly. It doesn't work. So he gave us this very, very clear form, and he said, first of all, you come back and you get in touch with your own suffering. We've all suffered. We all suffer still. We get in touch. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean just thinking of a list of all these terrible things happened to me and oh how I've suffered and oh I'm a victim and oh God it's so bad and that's not what that means. 
what does it mean to get in touch? And I had to really work with it. The number of times I sat there and I listened through the introduction, the first get in touch with your own suffering, then get in touch with the suffering of the people in front of you, the people around you, the people behind you, and then get in touch with the suffering of the world. And when you do that, compassion will naturally arise. I'm listening to it, and, oh, sounds good, sounds good. I'm sitting there with my cello, and then we chant. And sometimes I felt nothing, if I'm really honest. Sometimes I'm like, no, sorry, no compassion. I just feel tension, I feel pain, I feel some anxiety, this is really stressful. The microphone's in the wrong place, the sound system's all wrong, the sisters have gone flat. This is a disaster. What are we doing here? There's 10,000 people here. How come we didn't like have time to rehearse? Oh my goodness, what a mess. That's what I'm feeling, not compassion. It took me ages, you know, and I, and I, but I kept trying. I was like, okay, no, I'm going to... What does time mean? What does time mean? Like, what does it mean to get in touch with my suffering? And I would kind of have this visualization, yeah, these things happened, and I suffered, and yeah, nah, nah, nah. like the things I was aware of, but that wasn't, that wasn't it. It took me a long time to finally get to this point of like, oh no, he just means, I think, it's just my experience, of like, oh, if I just feel what is present right now in my body, in my feelings, in my mind, if I just feel what is there right now. Oh, yeah, there's already some sorrow, there's some feeling of burden, there's some feeling of pain, the pain that I carry, the pain that I habitually carry. I can feel it now, it's right there. I don't need to go into the past, it's right here now. <sighs> And when I touch it authentically at the level of sensation, not at the level of thought or story, it's not, it's not a narrative, it's not something that happened in the past, it's not something that I can even express in words, it's a sensation right now. Then immediately, oh, it's like a well that is dry. And the moment I get in touch really, it fills with the fresh, clear, cool water of compassion is an immediate and natural response. <sighs> oh, this pain just wants to be held. It's like the compassion is part of the pain. It's not a separate thing, it's just a natural expression of mm, this wants to be held. That's why Tai talks about a mother holding her crying baby, because then you, you don't have to think about that, you don't have to ask yourself. It's automatic, of course. Oh, this pain, let me hold it. <gasps> oh, let me soothe it. Let me gentle it. Let me be with it. Let me allow it to be there. Let me give it permission. And it's, it's vast, it's bigger than me. It's an ocean of compassion. It's not just like, you know, a peanut of compassion. It's vast. It goes way beyond me. So it's not my capacity. It's not my limited capacity. It's something immense. So, I'm still lying there on my bed. I got in touch with my sensations. There's some maybe sorrow, dread, fear, self-loathing, some mix of everything. But now it's being held, it's being met. I'm now in touch a little bit more with the truth. Not just with, I've got things to do and oh, I don't have time to do them and it's unfair and why did I agree to this? And I should have said, no, no, that's all narrative, it's all nonsense, I don't trust it. I don't buy it. What's happening is, ah, oh, these feelings are here now and they just need to be held and, and I can and, ah. Oh. 
and the violence I do to myself by not being there with them, I can put it down, I can be gentle, I can be present, I can be real. And my mind starts to settle, it's not panicking anymore, it knows that now I'm doing the thing that really needs to be done. This is the true task. This is my real responsibility. And yes, there's still some pain, but there's an immense space around it. It's being held in this immense embrace. And within even the heart of the pain, there is a bright star of joy, of life. Freedom. Freedom from chasing after my projects and f in the future and tasks and to-do lists and things to be done. Suddenly I'm free. I'm there. I'm really alive. I'm doing what needs to be done. I'm with this ocean of sensation. It's not even suffering anymore. It's changed. Because the idea, the label has gone. It's just ah, a scintillation of life, of sensation arising, of happening. I'm freed from the notion, from the reaction that, oh, don't like it, ah, push it away, no, too much, overwhelming. Ah. I'm freed from all of that. It's just ideas. I'm observing the impermanence, the constant flux it's like a shower of sparks. I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it's something thrilling, alive, amazing. Not necessarily totally pleasant, but there's freedom. And I can touch uh, non-grasping. I'm letting go now of even the idea that there is a me and that these are my sensations and I'm embracing the sensations. No, these are all notions, they're all ideas. There's just something arising. I don't even know what or who or whose. It's just a flux. I can touch a kind of sensation of uh, nothing to do. Any time the idea of the thought of a thing to do in the future comes up, I just instantly let it go. It comes up, I recognize it, I go, ah, no, that's not the present moment. Come back to the sensation. But I have to, oh, because uh, I, I need to, no, 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 not now. There's life going on. Let me be in touch with life. Not the idea about something happening in the future, but what is really going on right now. Let me touch it directly. Let me become it, become one with it. Wow, this is amazing. And then I get up. I smile to my roommate, and he looks at me, he's like, what? What's wrong with you? Why are you smiling like that? What's happening? And I go about my day, and I do all the things I have to do, and it's fine. No problem. I feel free, I feel light, I feel at ease. So yes, I know I can touch joy. But it takes some training. And we have to find many ways. I mean, there isn't enough time now. I have to end. But there's so many different ways we may, n we, we may need to have different tools to pick up. You know, other times, if I want to touch the seed of joy, I just visualize the, face, the faces of my nephew and my niece. <laughs> yeah. 
It's so easy. It's not necessarily my joy. Maybe in that moment, I don't have any joy. Fine, just borrow some. They've got plenty. I just, just, it takes a millisecond. Just imagine them and, yes. And sometimes I need that. I need to build that resource, that reserve. I need to store it up for the hard times. That's just one way. There are so many. So if you can't find joy, if you can't feel joy, don't worry. Don't give up. We need to have some courage as a meditator, have some courage to allow ourselves to experience suffering. It's the first noble truth. It's the door. It's the door to our joy, to our peace, to our freedom. The problem is when we touch it, it's like touching a hot stove. You just don't you wanna you don't want to touch it. You're like, no, I don't want that. That's not what I want. I want the good stuff. Don't give me this. This is bad. This is nasty. Ooh. I don't like it. You didn't tell me it was gonna be like this. You thought it was gonna, yeah, I thought it was gonna be like candles and you know incense and bamboo and yoga mats and you know in, uh, essential oil infusers and and pictures of pebbles and no, isn't that what it's supposed to be? Meditation, yoga, relax, zen, everything's nice. No. Meditation is an encounter with reality. And if you want an encounter with reality, you've got to be ready. You've got to be courageous. You have to allow yourself to feel what is really happening. And it may not be pleasant. Not right away. But that's where the freedom is. The freedom is in honesty, in a fearless encounter with reality. Because we don't want the fake thing. We don't want, you know, plastic meditation. We don't want, like, just the picture of meditation. We want the real thing. And if you do want only pleasant sensations, then I don't recommend it. Meditation is not for you. If you just want pleasant sensations, I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> because it's not going to work. Not long term. If, if you're practicing correctly, I guarantee you're going to encounter suffering. And that's good. That's what we actually want. It's not a bad thing. It means we're getting in touch with life, with things as they really are. But we need to continue. Don't stop there. Don't run away. Find friends to help you if it's too much. We do it together. When I don't have courage, I borrow my brother's courage. You know? When I don't have concentration, I borrow my community's concentration. I put myself in a place where I know even though I can't handle it, my community's got me. They've got my back. They'll lift me up when I'm down. And I help to lift others up when they're down. And I know maybe that sounds hard, like if you're on your own and it's in lockdown and where's my community? It's all very well for you to say that. Look, you're surrounded by people, but what about me? I'm alone. Yeah, it's hard. It is hard. But there are ways to connect, even online. I think we can find very meaningful, powerful ways to connect, to create communities of practice, to find support, to find true spiritual friends. This is possible. So 
I've gone on quite long. Um, I really hope I've at least addressed to some extent the questions that I was asked. Uh, they're very big questions and I don't presume to have a total answer. I just want to offer this, my own practice, what I actually do. And if you ask me what does it mean to come back to the island within, for me it is this. To come back to the island within does not mean to shut myself off from the world, to go into my panic room and close the door, no. For me, to go back to the island within means to get in touch with the now arising sensations in my body. Not somewhere else. It's not an imaginary refuge in my head. It's the real present moment sensations. Now, that's the island. But the island is also the way of approaching and being with and embracing those sensations. The island is kindness. It's gentleness. It's compassion. It's the confidence that by doing this, I can find peace and I can find freedom. So yes, it is a refuge. But the refuge is not just peace and happiness and no suffering. No, the refuge is a way to encounter the suffering. The refuge is an active, compassionate, kind response to the present moment situation exactly as it is. Which I don't get to choose. Right? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good, sometimes it's a mixture. The point about the island is it has to be there in every moment, not only when things are good. So the island is not a place of no suffering. The island is a way to encounter whatever is arising, including sometimes overwhelming sensations. Is that clear? It's a, it's a way, it's not a thing, it's a verb for me. Okay, this is just like, I'm sorry, I just made this up, but I'm just trying to share my experience of what for me is a refuge. A refuge is not a place, it's a way to encounter anything, anything at all, with kindness, with infinite compassion and space. That's a safe refuge. It works. And it doesn't mean cutting myself off from the people around me. If there's somebody in front of me and they are sharing their pain, that doesn't mean I can't take refuge in my island. It doesn't mean that in order to take refuge in my island, I have to go, no, 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 talk to the hand. I can't deal with your suffering. I need my peace. I need my safe little place. No, 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 this is too much. That's not, that's no refuge. That's the panic room. And it doesn't work because sooner or later you're going to have to open the door. You're going to run out of supplies. You've got to go out there. It doesn't work. The refuge has to work in every situation, including being in touch with somebody else's pain. Sometimes overwhelming pain. So what is the refuge? The refuge is to feel in that moment my sensations, which includes my reactions, my reaction to their pain. I feel it in my body. I allow compassion to arise because I'm still authentically in touch with my own pain in that moment, which may be a resonance, an echo of their pain. But because I'm authentically in touch with it here, compassion arises. I can't be in touch with it there. That doesn't work. I can't just imagine. I have to touch it here. This is where I am. The present moment for me is here. It's not there. 
So if I'm going to really be there for you, I have to be here in my island, which is my way of encountering this moment, of allowing it to be as it really is, not making up stories about it, not wanting it to be another way, not having preferences, not trying to reject it or not trying to want something different, just accepting it now as it is, which may include a lot of discomfort. But that's okay, I'm not afraid of the discomfort. I know I'm safe because I have mindfulness to help me be with all of that discomfort without reacting, without running away. That's my safety, that's my refuge. It's mindfulness, it's compassion, it's the insight born from experience that when I'm with that authentically, I'm free. I don't have to run after anything. I don't have to run away from anything. And then I can really be there for you. So, thank you for listening. I'm going to stop there. Uh, I know these are big questions, and I, I hope we can engage in a kind of collective uh, reflection on these questions as well. But it's ongoing. I don't presume to have a final definitive answer. It's not meant to be that. It's just meant to be like, this is where I'm at. This is how I address these questions in my life, in my experience. And, uh, and I hope to continue to discover more. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your presence. Let us enjoy three sounds of the bell and let go of the whole lot. Everything we just heard, forget about it.